Dear guests, welcome to our seventh lecture of the East Aegean and Anatolia lecture series for the year 2022. Our presenter today is one of the most significant names in the recent Hittite academic scene, Professor Claudia Glatz from the University of Glasgow's Archaeology Department. After finishing her BA and MA degrees at University of College London's Archaeology Department, Claudia Glatz completed her PhD in the same department in the same university in 2007. And her main research interests lie in investigating the social, political, and economic aspects of the early states and empires in the Near East and East Mediterranean. Besides this, she has also been involved in cultural heritage protection projects in the same region. To these ends, she has participated in a number of projects in Anatolia um, and um, in Northeast Iraq, such as the Gide archaeological project with Bleda During and the Paflagonia project with Roger Matthews, and um, the most recent project that she is leading, uh, the Sirwan regional project in Northeast Iraq. She has, Claudia Glatz, has an enviable publication record, and I do not have the time to go through all of them, but if we were to count merely some of her most recent books, we should obviously start with the 2020 publication, um, The Making of Empire in Bronze Age Anatolia, Hittite Sovereign uh, Practice, Resistance and Negotiation by Cambridge University Press, and we can follow with um, the edited volumes uh, with Blada during on uh, the GDA archaeological project named the Kinetic Landscapes. Um, she has also um, other uh, books, uh, edited volumes on the plain pottery traditions of the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East. Um, we also uh, know the 2009 book very well at Empire's Edge. Project Paflagonia Regional Survey in North Central Anatolia by British Institute uh, Publications. In recognition, in recognition of her outstanding work that has been reshaping the archaeology of empire in Anatolia and the wider region, Professor Glatz has received many prestigious fellowships and grants um, to name some of uh, the few the National Science Foundation at, U at USA and British Academy, and most recently the uh, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation Research Fellowship at the Freie University at Berlin. Um, Claudia Glass has kindly accepted to give an ARVA lecture uh, for this year that has a very thought-provoking title, Decentering the Archaeology of Empire in Late Bronze Age Anatolia, subalterity, rurality, and societies against the Hittite state, in which she argues that both the Hittite textual and archaeological records are skewed towards Hittite state institutions and elites, their ambitions, concerns, and practices of governance. However, even these seemingly state-centric centric data sets can be looked at from a range of different perspectives and um, hopefully provide us with information on the experiences of subaltern, rural and societies otherwise opposed to the Hittite state's apparatus. In this talk, therefore, she will take stock of extant data sets and ongoing research that attempts to decenter the archeology span of empire in late Bronze Age Anatolia and uh, she will also point at avenues for future work that will support this agenda. So we thank her again for being with us. Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jidem, for this very kind invitation and uh, your kind introduction as well. Um, um, I'm very excited uh, to give this talk today. Um, okay, let's see if this works. Oh, that's to be able to, there we go. Um, well, as the title of my talk implies, um, I'm going to try not to talk about the Hittite Empire too much today. Instead, I want to think about empire more broadly and explore avenues of research, um, some already tentatively or quite vigorously traveled in the Hittite context, uh, 
um, and some from comparable settings elsewhere in Western Asia that can help shed light on the experiences, the endurance and resistance against early empires such as the Hittites from as far below as we can get to. And others that may help shift our focus on aspects of life that to some extent at least existed outside of the direct grasp of imperial formations. Why? Because despite all the limitations of the texts and the archeology, span we already know a great deal about the Hittite empire by comparison and its imperial neighbors, predecessors and heirs and the conventional top-down storytelling of conquest, subjugation and rule is fast losing its final shreds of intellectual appeal in the light of current events that speak to the complex interconnectedness of our present with the stories that we tell of the past. Now, in all their misery, the past two years have been holding up a mirror to the project of modernity a stark reminder of how colonial and imperial pasts reach into our presence and shape in different ways our social conditions. It has drawn special attention to the privileges and inequalities that we have inherited and often unquestionably perpetuate. Spotlighted by despicable acts of violence and a new virus which has disproportionately ravaged the poor and the marginalized. A virus that also appears to have its origins in the ruthless destruction of our planet's ecosystem to keep the wheels of late capitalist system turning does it, that is itself the outgrowth of Western imperialism. This present, however, is not only marred in the leftovers of past empires, it is also an increasingly openly neo-imperial and as globalization gradually fails, also neo-nationalist in character. Both discourses appropriate ancient empires and associated concepts of civilization and selectively distill their materialities and complicated histories into simplified binary stories about belonging and difference. The ancient, modern, and the present are, in other words, inextric inextricably enmeshed, a Gordian knot whose constituent threads we ought to follow but not sever. So let me try and uh, briefly illustrate what I mean by that. Many of today's imperialist practices of the US, the EU, China, and others often, but not always, as Russia is currently demonstrating in all its brutality, tend to be indirect, veiled, and even vehemently denied. They range from aggressive foreign and economic policies to varying strategies of cultural hegemony, surveillance, data gathering, uh, misinformation, to strategic and conditional humanitarianism and development aid. Now, in contrast to these more or less disguised neo-imperialisms, the Islamic states or ISIS, uh, ISIS's purported caliphate appeared to Western journalists as one of the strangest states ever created when it first emerged in 2014. Now, to the student of imperial networks, however, it is less strange than disturbingly familiar. It is an empire in the making. This included the visceral immediacy of its biopolitics of um, terror, the self-publicized and expertly choreographed cruelty against people, things, and their pasts, which, as Aaron Tugendhaf points out in his recent book, closely mimics neo-Assyrian um, representations of imperial conquest. And then there was also the unabashed honesty of its imperial intent. Daesh's imperial realm, however, also manifested the patchy spatial structures of earlier such networks and their mostly unwilling publics and their political fragility. Now, I do not seek here to ascribe this phenomenon to a distant barbaric past that exists outside of our modern and allegedly civilized world. This is a situation that was forged in the cauldron of Western colonial and neo-imperialist interventions in the Middle East and beyond. The group's violent and rapid rise to, as well as subsequent fall from power, the incipient materiality and practice of its government, its ideology, and the punctuated cartography of its domination, nevertheless strikingly resonate with those of much, excuse me, much earlier imperial networks. And I would suggest that a comparative approach allows us to engage with both the ancient and the hypermodern more profoundly. On the one hand, this crass and all too recent example reminds us of what has been largely neglected in recent scholarship of colonial and imperial networks and tacitly accepted as the violent, unsavory underbelly of civilization, 
and the identities of those who claim descent from one such formation or another. Dash's unspeakable acts of violence and degradation have shocked the global audience to the core, but they are not so different from the terror and loss experienced by colonial and imperial subjects in other times and places, from French Algeria to the Neo-Assyrian one. Ancient imperialist masterminds, their cruelty and propaganda, moreover, continue to be celebrated, including in the West. A British Museum exhibition called I am Ashurbanibal, King uh, of the World, King of Assyria, dramatically displayed objects and wall reliefs from Assyria's capital cities located in modern day Iraq in 2018 and 19, coinciding with Britain's ongoing identity crisis and resurgent nostalgia for its own and long lost imperial grandeur at a time when the country struggled to reach a consensus over its place and role in Europe. The exhibition was also sponsored by British Petroleum, both a type fossil of Britain's colonial past in Iraq and elsewhere, and a poster child of today's corporate imperial manifestations. On the other hand, the analysis of Dash's practices of domination and political production, their material means and outcomes challenges empirically the extremist group's discourse of supreme power. There is ample evidence for the ways in which they're still to aggressively socialize a compliant citizenry, stringent behavioral rules, dress codes, educational measures, and brutal punishment for their transgression. Out of the rubble of the major cities wrestled from the group's grip have emerged the materialities of its imperial project and its temporary workings. Archival documents from Mosul, for instance, reveal an incipient state apparatus that collected taxes, ran a marriage office, issued birth certificates, organized bin collections. The iconic emblem of its state of terror, the black flag, flew not only over its tanks and marked the sites of its atrocities, but was also transfigured into a technology of bureaucratic authority when printed on the multiple forms and leaflets with which it sought to reproduce itself as legitimately sovereign. From 2014 to 2017, Daesh exerted varying degrees of domination over 12 million people. It never modeled itself as a traditional nation state, but it is because of international observers' reluctance to ascribe to it a state-like status in the Westphalian sense and the international aura of legitimacy that would have carried that we can track from detailed diachronic maps its emergent and ever morphing spatiality. This resembles closely what many archaeologists think more ancient imperial territorialities look like, but that we generally lack the data to map accurately. Daesh's caliphate crumbled nearly as quickly as it had risen under the onslaught of a concerted military effort by Kurdish, Iraqi, and international airstrikes. Those freed from its yoke and willing to speak to the media seemed consistent in their relief and lack of allegiance. What was achieved was temporary public submission and the extraction of resources but not in the creation of a type of supportive and cohesive public that is essential to long-term political survival. Now, while statues of slave owners and traders have been toppled recently, more hopeful ones are being erected, and the victims of Daesh are trying to rebuild their lives, academia, at least some parts of it, has embarked on perhaps the most serious effort to date to decolonize itself. Why and how we study early empires and what stories we hope to tell of them, I would suggest also require, and more so than other of our subfields, urgent reconfiguration. The starting point is the explicit recognition that the study of ancient empires is not a neutral scholarly pursuit, but always political as well as transhistorical in character. A second step is to strive for inclusivity in the perspectives, agencies, and experiences traditionally considered of little relevance to the making and undoing of imperial macro histories. Now, archaeology at large has long recognized the political dimensions of the past in the present. Archaeological work influenced by post-colonial and post-modern theories and philosophies have also drawn attention to the co-produced nature of colonial and imperial conditions and attempted to shift attention to subaltern populations and spaces. These theoretical perspectives and research agendas, with some notable exceptions, of course, have, however, by and large, slowly uh, been only slowly adopted into the study of empires in ancient Western Asia. And yet, the vast majority of the people in these imperial networks engaged in subsistence agriculture, lived in rural villages and hamlets, constituted the urban proletariat, or communities at the margins of imperial control 
and those who are actively acting against it. So we cannot readily be claiming to understand these political formations without a concerted effort to letting these subalterns speak, or perhaps more in the spirit of Gayatri Spivak's famous 1988 paper, take on the labor to represent and advocate for those entrapped in structures that violate them and deny them agency to speak for themselves, as well as impose the centralized identities from the outside. Michel Rof Troyot argued that historical narratives emerge from the duality of history as both the social process and the knowledge of that process. So what happened and what is said to have happened. The individuals and groups contribute to different degrees to both aspects of historical production. The socially and economically dominant similarly bring to bear greater resources to effect disproportionate material transformations carving monuments, building palaces, or digging massive canals, as well as to ensure their memorialization. So history in Trudeau's terms, and I would include here narratives constructed from the archeological record, is always a particular bundle of silences. Something, something we all have uh, come, become very much uh, acutely aware of in recent years. State institutions, both modern, um, and ancient aim to render simpler, more observable and manageable what is complex in nature and culture. Political ideologies too must be simple, generalized and decontextualized in their messages of collective belonging, privilege and alterity in order to be widely understood and incorporated into common consciousness and discourse. So to quote Pierre Bourdieu, to endeavor to think the state is to take the risk of taking over or being taken over by a thought of the state. To extricate one's thoughts from the state or from empire is therefore not so easy. It seems to fit like a comfortable intellectual slipper and to take it off is an ongoing challenge. Nonetheless, I would say that the aim of the study of ancient empires should be to revise and complicate such simple stories and to attempt to fill in ancient and modern silences. I've argued elsewhere that one way to approach this is to shift the conceptualization of empire away from a centralized political form to a relational model or a network. Here, historical form continuously emerges from a multitude of specific encounters between people, places, and things that establish, reproduce, transform, or disrupt existing interconnections in different spheres of life. Imperial polities in this model are always in the making through the tensions of imperial and non-imperial agencies, the various political potentialities of things and places, and the unexpected developments that result from their coming together in particular arrangements. In practice, there are, of course, numerous ways through which we can investigate this and with a view from below. For some, we have the analytical prowess, but need as yet to acquire the right data. Tony Wilkinson and colleagues, for instance, have documented the spread of small Iron Age settlements in the hinterlands of the Neo-Syrian capitals and into previously unsettled agriculturally more marginal regions, suggesting that these might have been settled by deputy populations. We also know from Hittite texts that thousands of people were deported and resettled, mainly in the central region of the Hittite polity and along its politically unstable northern and eastern fringes. Now, to understand the experiences of this particular group of subalterns, whether deportees, local farmers, or a mix of both, excavations are needed at these rural sites to provide contextual information on daily routines and cultural practices and how structural restraints were negotiated or subverted. Osteological, isotope, and DNA data would be able to shed light on mobility, food habits, and general health. Other states, other data sets, are more readily available and we need to find ways to integrate them and to re or read them against the grain. This includes investigating times and places that are normally overlooked or overseen, seen as irrelevant to understanding state and imperial uh, life histories. For instance, what comes after political collapse and what is abandoned and what continues to be reproduced in the generations that follow can illuminate critical facets of life under empire highlighting material cultural entanglements, but also deliberate rejections and posthumous subversions. Boris Kahatusa, the 200 hectare monumental capital city of the Hittite empire on the central Anatolian plateau, 
following its abandonment by the state apparatus and the partial destruction in the late 13th to early 12th century BC, was soon after occupied by a small early Iron Age village. The village was built on the outcrop of Duyukaya amidst massive abandoned late Bronze Age grain, grain silos. Its inhabitants continued to produce and consume for a generation or so Hittite style plain wheel made pottery alongside the gradually more dominant handmade and painted traditions. At the same time, the flimsy subterranean houses associated with material culture and zooarchaeological data suggest a radical rejection of previous Hittite or impure ways of doing and being. This lack of continuity of cultural practices and tastes is echoed across the, Hittite, the former Hittite heartland and points to profound disconnect between late Bronze Age political institutions and the communities that they had partially engineered over the preceding centuries using deportee population and populations and more or less pacified adversaries. That these are choices rather than merely situational impositions or like the, the result of collapse in a general sense can be seen in a range of spheres of life. Now, metallurgical analysis, for instance, by Seppi Lena recently showed that the trade in metals and with it trans-regional connectivity was by no means um, stopped um, at the end of empire, but appears to have flourished. So these are not communities scraping the leftovers, but uh, defining new ways of life. Examining another such post-collapse scenario at the Iron Age site of Godin and Nushi Jan in uh, Western Iran, Reinhard Bernbeck in a recent paper uh, draws our attention to archaeological classification and how terms such as main occupation and squatting or post-abandonment phase implicitly impose modern value hierarchies and as such contribute to the production of top-down state-centric historical narratives. Building on Henri Lefebvre's notion of conceived versus lived space, Bernbeck illustrates how use histories of structures during and especially following their main in inverted commas occupation phases can reveal tensions between different social groups that may have otherwise been hidden. At Nushijan, for instance, around a um, hundred year long use of the columned hall as representational space is followed from around 650 BC without evidence of, of a stratigraphic break by what the excavators described as a 75 year long squatter phase. During this phase and over the course of four remodeling events, the squatters, so-called squatters, divided the structure internally into several smaller architectural units so we can see the conversion of a monumental space conceived primarily for representational use into a more complex one characterized by a range of domestic and production activities more typical of a specialized peasant household. The column hall at Godin II undergoes a comparable development, although more time appears to have elapsed than at Nushijan uh, between the end of the representational phase of the building and its subsequent reinterpretation rather than merely the afterlife of a once impressive representational structure, Ben Beck proposes that what we are seeing at Godin and Nushijan, stratigraphic sequences is the resolution of previous social repressions and antagonisms, tensions that subordinate groups were not able to express during the first phase of the columned hall's lives, but that they were able to release subsequently through the imposition of their own alternative spatialities. Now, the majority of subalterns in the ancient world and to an extent still today live far away from such representational centers and would have been part of rural peasant communities. I've already touched on how regional surveys have over the past decades contributed much new knowledge about non-urban landscapes. At the same time, there has been almost no interest in rural lifeways and agency per se and explanatory frameworks for development and change in such landscapes are firmly centered on deliberate imperial practice and interference or urban dynamism more generally. This is because as Astrid von Oyen recently outlined, the rural is generally in envisaged as an unchanging and in this manner, the binary opposite of the urban. Rural life is either perceived as an eternal present filled with endless drudgery that provides the urban with the resources to advance and progress or as a romanticized bucolic idyll. So while we wait for some very brave archeologists to excavate a farmhouse or two, there are other ways in which we can investigate the nexus 
at which the lives and agencies of rural subalterns intersected with imperial agendas and performances. One such sphere is the circumscription, accumulation, and redistribution of rural surplus. Maurice Bloch proposed that ritual and everyday reality must interlace and overlap to a significant degree in order for rituals to be successful in the creation of community. Politically particularly potent, therefore, are rituals that intertwine, intertwine centralizing institutions with the reproduction of life. In the context of Hittite Anatolia and in other agrarian societies, the natural reproductive cycle was the fulcrum or potentiality with which existential necessity could be transmuted into imperial sovereignty. Through state ritual, universal reproductive time was appropriated into the Hittite Empire's official and extensive festive calendar, surplus collection rationalized and symbolically significant local places turned into centers of state cult and connected through ritual movement paraphernalia and protagonists. Agricultural produce and the foods produced from it feature prominently in both the provision lists of major cult festivities and the inst instructions for their performances, including the collection storage and more indirectly implied the distribution of grain. The Hittite capital city featured a number of very large scale storage facilities whose com combined facility combined capacity, excuse me, would have fed around 30,000 people for a year, which is about twice its hypothesis inhabitants. The circumscription of surplus from farming communities is itself an arena in which both political power is performed and relationships of domination are negotiated. Tax collection in the central region of the Hittite Empire appears to have been in the hands of the local, a local body, the so-called men of the town or district, and a particular type of official, who were officials who were responsible for the forwarding of goods and produce to the capital. There is some contemporary textual mentions of long-winded negotiations over tax reductions, and there is also ample historical and ethnographic sources from other times and places that paint a compelling picture of the act of extraction. As my colleague Michael Given put it, this is, this is a morass of disagreements, partial payments, negotiations, claims, and counterclaims. Beyond this, uh, the archibotanical evidence provides us with insights into the strategies of resilience and subversion employed by Hittite peasants for the cultivation of tax crops. Now, a 16th century underground silo complex at Hattusa, which was partially destroyed by fire and yielded hundreds of tons of charred grain. Um, so Charlotte Diffie and colleagues uh, in a paper from two years ago presented the latest archibotanical and isotopic results uh, from uh, this silo complex. And the results are very instructive. So the analyzed samples come from five different and storage compartments, uh, including mostly hulled barley, emma, and einkorn, alongside uh, a really surprising quantity of wheat seeds. The cereal and wheat taxa also showed very distinctive combinations um, for each of the analyzed storage chambers, as do the carbon and nitrogen stable isotope values. Diffie and colleagues concluded that the contents of each chamber was cultivated under distinct growing and land management conditions. So different kinds of tillage, weeding and manuring practices, and that most fall into the low intensity ca uh, category of land manage management and intervention. In other words, they were neglected. Taken together, now this evidence suggests that the grain and the storage chambers present crops deliberately grown and deliberately neglected for taxation from different agricultural communities. This data echoes uh, the 15th century um, archibotanical evidence from Kusha Kusarisa, another Hittite center. And here two small grain sizes and large quantities of weeds point to the ne neglected fields planted to fulfill tax obligations. That small grain size and weeds were a distinctive strategy to cope with and subvert and resist state taxation and not the result of ignorance or inadequate agricultural techniques. Um, is shown by the contemporary find of high quality emma in one of the uh, monumental structures at Kushakwa. So clearly this is a potentially very fruitful avenue for future investigations. 
there are, of course, many other kinds of avenues that we could be exploring here um, in the light of the themes that I've outlined at the start, but there's only so much time. And I would like to end with a discussion of a topic that is close to my ongoing current research on mountains as resistant landscapes um, and the societies that ancient states and imperial records perform as their ultimate uncivilized other and then how we might shift our perspective on these communities and the places that they inhabit. These others can be found in a range of landscape types from wetlands to deserts and jungles. And it is often uh, the less hierarchical and fluid socioeconomic organizations that these inhabitants of these ecosystems have developed that make it difficult for agrarian and imperial formations to exert permanent control over them. In Eurasia, the role of the other um, is more often than not, however, associated with the mountains. This trope emerges for the first time in the written sources and in monumental representations in the late third millennium BC in Mesopotamia. With the inhabitants of the Zagros Mountains portrayed as non or semi-humans who are savage in their attacks on lowland urban centers and barbarous in the lack of knowledge about practices of what's considered civilized life, agriculture and its products, permanent human and divine dwellings, and appropriate divine worship. Now, this uh, Mesopotamian Zagros narrative foreshadows uh, rather closely the Hittite Empire's representation of its relationship with its own highland neighbors in the Northern Black Sea region. Here, Hittite institutional authority and Northern communities under Hittite rule, and a series of loosely associated groups that are referred to collectively as the Casca in Hittite texts, found themselves at times, and according to Hittite texts, violently pitched against each other and coalescing in volatile and temporary alliances at others. This picture that the Hittite state sources have painted of the Casca and the ongoing Northern conflict unequivocally dominates research on this topic. And with few, but of course, notable recent exceptions has largely been perpetuated, has largely been perpetuating the status perspectives of the texts, uh, the Hittite texts that cast these Casca as tribal foes um, that raid and destroy Hittite temples and communities. Archaeological research in the North has been comparatively scarce, but by no means absent. And it is from the results of surveys, occasional excavations and chance finds that a more nuanced and complicated picture of this particular society ostensibly against the Hittite state has begun to emerge. Now this includes, of course now a well-known string of fortified strongholds along the Devres uh, River Valley, a strategic east-west communication corridor and topographic watershed between the hilly landscape of the central Anatolian plateau and the rugged mountains of the Pontic range. These sites have strong material culture links to the Hittite central region and the frequent placement of these forts alongside persistent local places of settlements. So mounded sites whose surface collections suggest occupation either from the Calcolithic or the early Bronze Age and uh, into the Roman or uh, Byzantine periods. So these present long-term local centers suggest that Northern communities may have been rather resistant to Hittite state control, at least at times. Moving North, we have a, a metal hoard from the site of Kunik in Kastamonu. This is an interesting site because as far as I can tell, the other uh, stratigraphic material dates to the early Bronze Age and the Iron Age um, and settlement and craft working context. So this is a hoard that contains late Bronze Age uh, metal drinking vessels but also artifacts that do not fit a Bronze Age date. And so the hoard itself might have come together at a later point in time. There's another uh, cave site, the uh, Buzmarse, that yielded a sword that finds comparison uh, in the central Anatolian uh, plateau. These are all finds that in the past have been interpreted, including by myself, as possible loot from Hittite temples. Um, as described, for instance, in this lengthy uh, prayer by Arnuwanda and Asmunikal, um, they, the Casca, plundered silver and gold, writer and cups of silver, gold and copper, your, the gods, objects of bronze and your garments. They divided them up amongst themselves. And then they go, the, uh, the, the, the prayer goes on and they said that they also took the priests, the priestesses, the musicians, the cooks, the bakers, the plowmen, the gardeners, the cattle, the sheep, the land, the vineyards, and so on. Now, it is possible that these metal vessels are indeed looted from Hittite temples. 
More interesting than the manner of their arrival in the north, however, is the question why these bronze vessels could be of interest to communities in the north. Communities who could easily access local metal sources, for instance, at the Curie mines nearby, and who evidently had metallurgical knowledge. The most convincing answer would seem to lie with the ritual and commensal roles of these vessels that may point towards shared or increasingly shared beliefs and practices within a border zone context and the cultural hybridity we would expect to emerge over the course of several hundred years of interaction. Survey for the north along the Black Sea coast have identified late Bronze Age Central Anatolian pottery types alongside highly localized materials. These were concentrated around the site of Oxula Kale at the Gide coastal hinterland. Here's some examples of this material, which also consists mainly of serving equipment. Most recently, and as, uh, comes a, an astonishing and amazing find um, of a wooden floor construction inside uh, the cave of Inenu Marasa, which is being investigated by a team from Zonguldak University. And that cave has produced the first stratified and uh, radiocarbon dated late Bronze Age and early Iron Age material in the Western Black Sea region. Among the material recovered are metal weapons and figurines that reference materials and concepts well attested in the Hittite centers further south, but that also clearly have a local character. The cave also produced spindle whorls and loom weights, which may suggest a domestic context. Now, this is all very preliminary at the moment, and the results are only being published uh, at, the, at this moment. Um, so the pottery um, hasn't been uh, published yet. There's some tantalizing hints in a recent publication that there might be continuity between Bronze Age and the early Iron Age handmade material in the cave, but uh, we're going to have to wait until uh, uh, this material is, is published more fully. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, we can move to Omarjhuk, um, the likely location of the Hittite cult center of Nerik, which corroborates the existence of localized late Bronze Age cultural traditions in the Pontic region. The first monumental structure at Omarj, together with the fortification wall, a gate, a postern passage, all of which are hallmarks of Hittite urbanism, dates to the 17th to 16th century BC. This phase of the site came to an end in a conflagration sometime in the 15th and 14th century, followed by a 150 year period of very minor activity at the site. Now a series of what the excavators called cult depositions, so ceramic assemblages consisting of mostly bowls and miniature vessels may be contemporary with the older monumental structure and present a continuity in cult practice in these ruined buildings. There's another subsequent structure whose inventory of characteristic bull figurines and miniature cups leaves little doubt about its ritual function. This structure dates to the mid-late 13th century. It too fell victim to a massive conflagration, the source of which is as yet uncertain. The pottery in question comes from the earliest late Bronze Age levels and differs radically from formal and stylistic terms from the North Central Anatolian or Hittite ceramic tradition. At the same time, it shares with the latter several key technological characteristics. So this new Pontic pottery is of high quality and produced on the wheel with brown or brown washed surfaces. Unlike the plain buff colored wares of North Central Anatolia, however, the majority of recovered fragments are decorated with geometric motifs. The faceted rims and the painted decoration suggest that this wheel made late Bronze Age tradition was the predecessor of the painted handmade pottery that characterized the early Iron Age village on Bikaya that we saw earlier, as well as a number of other northern sites, including Pit Horizons at Ormaj itself. Similarly, idiosyncratic is the development of the North Central Anatolian style ceramic assemblage, which mirrors closely assemblages at Hittite centers in the early occupation phase. However, the pottery from the later, the 13th and 12th century BC context, presents only a small fraction and skewed functional distribution of contemporary southern repertoires. And in particular, the Ormaj assemblage is dominated by what is generally referred to as uh, miniature vessels, like small shallow cups and juglets with pointed bases and other cult-related libation equipment, suggesting a highly specialized uh, functional scope. 
especially underrepresented are handmade plates, which account for up to 20% of Hittite assemblages elsewhere. These are thought to be primarily used for, used for baking bread. And then near absences or much might suggest a difference in culinary practices. Another local peculiarity consists of vessels with horizontal fenestrations, whose function is as yet unknown, but could also seem to point to its local ritual purposes. So what is emerging from all this new data? Now the Hittite, there's no doubt that the Hittite imperial encounter it created the casca in the way that the Hittite imperial propaganda needed them to bring into sharper focus what it means to be Hittite. So it's a tool of state making. However, this data also increasingly points towards centuries, if not millennia of distinct and diverse local cultural practices in the Pontic Highlands, ranging from settlement preferences and construction techniques to ceramic traditions, which underwrote and reproduced in their daily material expressions and experiences, one or more distinct non or possibly counter imperial identities. At the same time, and as might be expected from prolonged borderland interactions, recent findings also are beginning to show us um, a series of processes of cultural amalgamation and the development of distinctive borderland practices and fashions that differed from those of Hittite centers further south. So approaching the Hittite Casca question from a perspective that is not centered on origin or ethnicity, but on cultural practices has begun to challenge the simple and familiar story of empire and alterity in and outside. So fingers crossed for many more inner new caves uh, in the future. So to briefly sum up, I've argued that in order um, for the study of ancient empires to remain relevant in a world defined by structural inequalities, climate and health crises that were in one way or another set in motion by past imperial and colonial practices and mindsets, it needs to undergo a radical shift in perspective. This includes the explicit acknowledgement of many of the many and complicated ways in which scholarly thought and practice is the product of modernity and how enlightenment notions of the necessity of state power and its ultimate benefit for those who surrender to it have shaped our discourses on these subjects. The notion of empire, ancient or modern, is in an is the notion of empire is, in, is not in any way benevolent. It's a dangerous and self-serving fiction and one that stands in the way of imagining the sorts of radically different collectives and modes of coexistence and collaboration that we now must rapidly develop. Giving voice to the subaltern experiences uh, presents an important component of these processes. Their voices and perspectives from below complicate imperial narratives and help to presence empire. In the dual sense that historical empires are constructed as subjects by scholarly and public discourses in the present, and in terms of the depth and breadth of their impact on different subaltern lives in the past. Such a shift in perspective requires a challenge in, sorry, excuse me, a change in how research funding is distributed, which today still remains fixated on firsts and superlatives but we will only really find out about peasant and deportee communities in the Hittite, Kassite or Assyrian empires if we excavate their houses, storage facilities, can reconstruct their subsistence strategies and gain an in-depth understanding of their health and living conditions. In the meanwhile, we can challenge ourselves to read existing data against the grain and across conventional temporal, cultural, political and topographic boundaries. The examples I've briefly touched on include analytical, their chronicity across horizons of political collapse, resilience and subversion in the face of direct state demands and the exploration of transcultural net networks connecting diverse communities outside of imperial logics and territorialities. The possibilities for such a resistant assembling of archeological and textual data are manifold. We have already heard about in many ways, some of the creative ways in which this can happen um, across different aspects. Uh, of life in the Hittite uh, world. Thank you.